Now, I'm going to make Absolutely. the case uh, with some facts for the first time in my speaking career <laughs> that uh, not only is it now is a good time, but it actually has been a good time for a long time. Let me start you off with some numbers. 1972, Hospice, statistically insignificant. 1976, McBride, 0.2%. Anybody know where I'm going with this, some of the older people? 1980, Clark, 1.1%. 1 .1%. 1984, Berglund, 0.3%. 1988, Paul, actually there's an R in front of that, 0.5%. 1992, Maru, 0.3%. 1996, Brown, with an H in front of it, 0.5. Brown again, 2000, 0.4. Badnarik, 2004, 0.3, and Barr, 0.4 percent. Uh, virtually no change in 30 years. Uh, this is the number of votes cast for libertarian presidential candidates, which I think is at least some indication of the degree to which libertarian ideals are pitching into the more of the general population. Uh, if this was your returns on your stockbroker, your, your, your investments, your stockbroker was phoning you up every year saying this is what we're doing, would you say, yeah, just keep going, we don't need to change a thing? <laughs> of course you wouldn't. You'd be like, man, I'm, I'm going to find out where you live and vote you. Uh, so here's another uh, set of statistics. In uh, 2010, a one in six Americans dependent upon state anti-poverty programs. This doesn't just mean that it's kind of helpful for them. They are dependent upon them. Uh, 2007 to 2010, Medicaid recipients grew by 17%. Of course, the price tag went up 36% because it's the government. Number of Americans receiving food stamps went up by 50% over the last few years to almost 40 million. Welfare dependents grew by 17% to almost 4.5 million. As of 2010, 10 million Americans depend on unemployment insurance, a 400% increase since 2007, uh, which has raised the cost from 43 billion to 160 billion. And you could go on and on. But the reason that I'm quoting these statistics is that libertarians have been unable to shrink the size and power of the state at a time when far fewer people were dependent upon the government. We're not even talking about government workers here, who I agree are the ultimate welfare recipients, although they do more harm than welfare recipients in general. And that's, I think, very, very important to recognize that we are looking at trying to shrink the state at a time when far more people are dependent upon the state than in the past, when we weren't able to shrink the state. I think that's an important thing to, to understand. I'm gonna to switch to a mic where I can walk. Now, of course, people will say that we have a Ron Paul, and that's a very valid thing to say. Of course, Ron Paul is a, a great orator, a very intelligent man, and a supremely able politician, which is not an easy combination of skills to come by. But for those of us who are older, we know that this is not the first time that libertarianism has received a significant boost. Who would have predicted, say, in 1940, that Ayn Rand's uh, books would be so phenomenally popular, would rank second in influence after the Bible, uh, Atlas Shrugged is second in influence after the Bible. Of course, they both have the same kind of ending. Uh, and <laughs> seven million books, uh, incredible uh, objectivist uh, uh, movements uh, in America, a significant boost. Uh, you got Barry Goldwater in 1964, amazing uh, boost. Uh, we had how many people would have predicted the current financial disasters if they'd been told that Alan Greenspan, a free market uh, fanatic and a former objectivist, was chairman of the Federal Reserve. Imagine how quickly we're going to go back to the gold standard with that kind of uh, individual in power. Well, of course, it didn't work out that way. Governor Schwarzenegger brought his Conan sword to his budget meetings to remind people to cut, and he had a balanced budget amendment to boot. How's California's budget crisis doing these days? Well, uh, pretty catastrophically. So I think these things are important to understand. The one thing that I would recognize, and I think really recommend, is to remember that Humility is essential in intellectual pursuits. The one reason that I don't think that politics is going to save us, I think that we can be saved, I just don't think politics is going to do it, is intellectual humility. I don't think that I'm smarter than Ayn Rand. I don't think I'm smarter than John Locke or Lysander Spooner or uh, Bastiat or, or uh, Hayek or uh, Mises or any of the great geniuses who have worked or all the founding fathers put together in a big brain blender. I don't think I've got a tenth of the one percent of the intelligence of these people. And they failed to restrain the size and power of the state. And they failed to restrain the size and power of the state when the state was teeny tiny, is what my daughter would say, teeny tiny compared to now, right? You couldn't restrain the power of the state when it didn't have fiat currency, didn't have a central bank. You couldn't restrain the size and power of the state in the 18th and the 19th centuries when it didn't have a monopoly over the indoctrination of children. Couldn't do it. 
when it didn't have electronic surveillance, uh, when it didn't have spy satellites, when it didn't have weapons of mass destruction, when it didn't have very tight control over the media. Couldn't do it then. And my feeling is that if you, if you want to lift a truck, which is uh, restraining the states for politics, you might want to start by lifting something a little bit smaller. And so if people can't lift something smaller, I don't assume they can lift a truck. And if you can't restrain the size and power of the state when the state is one-tenth or one-twentieth the size it is now, through the force of your arguments, through the political process, there's no reason whatsoever to believe that we can restrain the size and power of the state now when it's much larger. When it's much larger, it's much more powerful, has access to far more control and, and violence and propaganda and magic money. You can't do it. If you can't do it when it's small, you can't do it when it's bigger. Now, this doesn't mean that there's no way to control the size and power of the state. I'll make the case for that perhaps a little later. But I think that we can safely say that the electoral process is not, has not, you know, this ample evidence that it has not worked in the past. I think there's lots of good reasons for that. And I think that there's ample evidence to say that it's not going to work in the future. Last point I'll make before Ernie comes and shreds me some wisdom is there's a test for controlling the state. And it's a test that any one of us can do. I accept that the state is a, it's the criminal gang that won and therefore it gains legitimacy. What's that old statement? Treason doth never prosper. What's the reason? Why, if it prosper, none dare call it, call it treason. <laughs> or I think it was Alexander the Great who captured a pirate. I'm gonna put you to death for piracy. Well, you're just a head pirate, you just call it a navy. <laughs> so if you accept that the state is a criminal organization and you believe that through the power of your eloquence and the power of infiltrating a system and getting someone up to the top that you can reduce the criminality of a criminal organization. Well, there's an easy task. You, you just have to join your local mafia and work your way up to the top. You know, you can watch The Sopranos, you can do your research, get ready. But you can work your way to the top of the mafia and then you can say, listen, we need to cut our murders by heart. We need to cut our extortion. We need to cut our drug running. We need to do all, we need to restrain the criminality of this organization. It's an easy test. Now, if you can do that with your local mafia or your local drug dealers or whoever it is that is a criminal organization right now, well, that's a great proof that you can infiltrate an evil organization and get it to reduce its criminal activities. Easy peasy. I mean, I've put this out there for years. I'm not sure that too many libertarians have actually gone undercover and attempted to prove the thesis that through the power of persuasion, you can reduce the criminality of an organization because we all know that can't happen, right? Or, if you think that it's too dangerous to join a criminal organization, you can join the teachers' union. And work your way up to the top of the teachers' union and then get the teachers' union to advocate the privatization of public schools. That's, you know, that's another way that you can test whether the power of eloquence can turn an organization against what it's designed for. Government is designed to punish its friends and reward its enemies to get people stuff for free. Right? Government. Slogan is, free evil! And you can't get the government to turn against its objective, which is to steal and pillage and control and get stuff for free and give stuff for free. So that's my challenge, that if people believe that you can overturn the greatest criminal gang in history through the power of eloquence and through rising up through the ranks and turning it against itself, fantastic. Maybe you can join, and it's not totally small. You know, join a local Jane Austen book club and try and turn it against Jane Austen. <laughs> Join a pharmaceutical lobby company, rise to the top, and then get it to advocate for the ending of pharmaceutical patents. But you could go on and on with a million examples, and I won't, though I've been known to. But I'm sort of arguing that politics is a belief in the virtue of a government that it doesn't exist. If you can't join a criminal gang and make it into a bunch of relatively good guys, or at least less bad guys, it ain't never going to work with the state, because the state is the most powerful. You can't start with the smaller, it won't work with the larger. And with that, I turn the microphone over to Ernie Hancock, and I'm going to go and hide behind the stage in a fetal position. That's going to be all right. <laughs> what he said. Yeah. You know, I got to give a, a public announcement. Um, 
don't take candy from strangers, especially if they're really big lollipops. What I want to do is make sure that we understand that my goal was never to change the political system. It was to make fun of it. You know, when you, when you start off as a young activist, it was 88, my wife and I, we just had our fourth child. We're, we're coming into the movement, we're starting to understand, and when you actually had to go to the library and read the books, you had to go and read the actual law. You had to see this inch and a half thick thing that they just passed and realize, what did this gang with a flag just do to me? And the future of my children. So you start looking for places, you know, how do you express yourself? I wanted to, there was no anarchist, voluntarist, whatever is movement. You know, you said anarchist, and you got guys from Seattle with dreadlocks in the middle of the intersection banging drums. You know, that, that, that was, you know, not how it was perceived, uh, what we would like. Now, so I wanted to, I just made some notes. And, and the main thing that I wanted to get across is that I never saw that there was a central plan for freedom. Duck, everybody. Duck? Oh. They're protecting our freedom. All right, well, what? so I wanted to make sure that as we had this discussion, it's a really a debate, because this is what the debate was. We're looking at what is it that we can do to free as many minds as possible, and it's a pathway that's just hopefully a lot of us out there being active are driving them towards you. And is there some database I want to increase? Is there something that I want to do with all these people that I've freed their minds so they can be in my collective or vote for me or something? No. I haven't voted for a long time, but I run for office. I run for Secretary of State, big giant black signs that says, still voting? With the V, the V for vendetta and voting. Okay, still voting? So the thing is, is that you can't you use politics in order to be a, a mechanism by which you can free minds. How better to make fun of the process? How better to ridicule it than up on the stage standing next to the people doing it? We do this on a regular basis in Phoenix. And the reason is, is because we know how screwed up it is. We know that the goal is to survive what's coming, to keep breathing in and out as long as possible, because you're not going to beat the state out here in the battlefield of whatever they got their Harriers that just took off or where it was. You know, <laughs> you beat them up here. The battle is between the ears. And everything that we have done, the love evolution and all this other stuff, that's just one of 15 gazillion projects that we've done over the decades. And we've done many since then. You know, the dime cards, cop block is coming online, free aid. I mean, I'm, I'm pushing all this because this is where we're going. Humanity marches on. And to think that I'm going to eliminate the tea parties or thousands of people that just get a bunch of DVDs. <laughs> then we have Occupy Wall Street. No, they're too communist. They're, you know, they're, they got, they're, they're different. They're just a younger version of the Tea Party with professors or freshmen and sophomore in college told that, you know, if they love the planet, they should be out there opposing the Wall Street one percenters and say that they should pay your uh, education bill so the professor still got a job or something. I mean, you know, it's really no more complicated than that. And you go there, and there are thousands of these young people that just went there to find out what the hell happened. They have no idea. So where do you go to get the attention of these people? Politics, in Arizona, I'll give you an example. 2004, I run for U.S. Senate against John McCain. Oh, I had some fun with that one. Now, what do I have to get? Ballot staff, Libertarian Party there. I used to be county chairman and everything. I've had my fill of the party, but it was a good vehicle. 85 signatures, something like that, I need to get, and I'm on the ballot in the general. Hello. And what do we talk about? Oh, you're not even a voter. Well, let's talk about that. Then they don't want to talk about it anymore. Because from inside the system, on a large scale, we're able to make the case of no government is better than what we got. They always go like this. On my radio show and stuff, they go like this. You already, uh, well, you're just an anarchist. Compared to what? What we got now? This is my choice. Seriously, none or this? That's my choice, none. I vote none. <laughs> so the, the, the debate and the discussion I'm hoping to have with you and with uh, Stefan, is that can we use this corrupt, 
worthless piece of crap called the electoral process that has absolutely no way of measuring what we want anyway, as if that could be done. Can we use that process to free as many minds as possible? I say yes, and you can be creative in it, but I don't lie to people. I don't tell them that I vote. I don't ask them to vote for me. I question the process at every level. But you get to make the argument, if you're going to have a gun in the room, what is it there for? Protection of the rights of the individual. That's the only justification for it. If it doesn't do that, you alter or abolish. And the louder and as many times from many different directions I can say that, the better. And even Stefan wouldn't argue of how many legions have been stampeded towards his philosophy, and I support what he does, get little QR stickers, put them in high schools. Yeah, you want to mess up a kid's mind, have them listen to Stefan Molyneux for a couple hours. <laughs> so this is what I use the political process for. If you make the argument, then that even that, even that, using that process, should be abandoned because it gives too much credence to even, even that, just using it in any way, gives credence to a system that should be abandoned entirely and shunned. You know, I'm getting closer to that. But only because we've had the technology and the ability to reach minds with the click of a smartphone button. That is, you know, the only argument I get is because I am not going to abandon these minds that need the information on Wall Street. This is any more than I would abandon the Tea Party, any more than I would abandon people that are voting because they are minds that if we don't advocate for the freedom for everybody, we're never going to get it for ourselves. What do you say? Well, this, uh, the approach of politics uh, is, there's, there's two things that people find generally of, of value in the political process. The first is, I think, completely delusional, but I can understand why people want to believe it, which is that if we get the right guy in power, then we're going to shrink the size of the state. So there's a direct, you know, vote for Ron Paul, vote for whoever is going to have the, the best ideological approach, and I have no doubt that Ron Paul has great integrity, great knowledge, great intentions, I have no issue with him as a very moral human being. But the idea is that we get somebody in power, we're going to shrink the power of the state, shrink the size of the state. That's sort of one thing. And when people point out that this is statistically impossible, uh, based upon the trends of the past 70 years, people say, well, no, we've got a backup plan. The backup plan is even if the guy doesn't get into power, he's going to educate people, right? He's going to educate people. People are going to learn about Austrian economics, they're going to learn about free market economics, libertarianism. Lots of people will come to the logical Cons logically consistent application of the NAP and property rights, which is a free market to anarchism or voluntarism, and that's great. But I would argue that education will not bring us freedom. And I will tell you why, and then you can tell me if I'm wrong. I could be. How many people here have tried to lose weight in their lives? Anybody? Yeah, we all. All at one time or another, you pass 40 and it's like, hey, what the hell's going on down here? I used to be able to eat all this crap, and now I can't. And uh, people buy diet books, does that cause them to lose weight? They get educated about nutrition, does that cause them to lose weight? No. Some of the biggest people in the planet have the most diet books on their shelves. Knowledge does not translate to action in any direct form. If knowledge translated into action in a direct form, then those who knew the most about free market economics would be in the free market. Right, but there are lots of libertarian academics whose work I respect and whose people I respect, but they stay in a quasi-statist environment, even though they know a huge amount about free market economics. Because we're going to have to have some sacrifice. Oh no, I said the word sacrifice. That means all the objectivists in the world are going to tell me that I don't understand the word. And... By the way, did you get that Ayn Rand was an anarchist? There's no government in Gulf's Gulch. Anyway. There is going to be sacrifice. People are going to have to make do with less from the government than they're paying. If, I mean, unless there's going to be a default, in which case there's going to be a really short, sharp pain. There's going to have to be sacrifice. And my belief is that you really can't rationally or consistently or believably call for sacrifice unless you're willing to make sacrifices yourselves. Right? And yet politics doesn't work that way. Ron Paul's constituents receive lots of money from the federal government, brought home to them by Ron Paul. 
Now, there's lots of good arguments as to why he does that. You know, they just get money back and all that. But of course, it's not true, particularly. I mean, the government just prints the money. They're just taken from the unborn. But the reality is that Ron Paul's constituents aren't willing to make the sacrifices. And we assume that they understand something about Austrian economics or they somewhat libertarian because they vote for the guy. And so my question is, how many people are we convincing to make sacrifices? What we need to understand is that education alone is not going to bring people to the place of sacrifice. There's something else, and I'll make the case if we have time. It doesn't matter if we do it today or not. It's all on my website. But there's other things that we need. Education alone is not going to bring the kind of consistency of action. It's not going to lead people to a place of sacrifice. It's not going to happen any more than reading diet books makes you thin. Americans, arguably, have much more access to information about diets and nutrition than they've ever had before in history. And yet, they keep getting bigger, statistically. So education alone isn't going to do it. Politics isn't going to do it. I think there's another approach. And what always concerns me, and I'll stop right here, what always concerns me is that we have to look at the road not taken. Right? We spend millions of dollars on political action, tens of millions of hours. People devote their entire lives to it with noble intentions, with good intentions, with some of the, my favorite people in the world are libertarian political activists. But when you go in the wrong way and you think you go in the right way, you stop looking at your compass. And we've stopped looking for alternatives to political action. Not all of us. I mean, there are agorists, there are other people like me who advocate peaceful parenting is the way to go. But my concern is that we put so much energy into this, and if it is the wrong way to go, we are not seeing all of the other alternatives that we could be pursuing that I think scientifically and statistically have been shown to work. And we put our faith in politics and education for which there's no evidence that it's going to work. There's no central plan for freedom. And wherever it is that we do wind up going, you know, it's how you're going to get there. And I tell you, the first way you're going to know that you even have a chance of getting there is to know where the hell you're going. Who, who shows that? Who demonstrates that? Who lives that? You do. You, you have to understand, you know, from my perspective, it's very, I'm very misunderstood a lot. Of, I don't care. You know, I don't make a big deal out of it. But when we do the Ron Paul Evolution thing, everybody just assumed I was Republican Ron Paul support and vote. I wasn't. He had spoken at two of our freedom summits that Mark and I put on every year, you know, similar to this inside. We have uh, freedom summits. He's spoken at three of them. We knew what his rhetoric was going to be. We knew what he was going to be saying. We were like, you know, if he gets up on that podium one time, we knew what was going to happen. So we take the love of Lucian Loeb that we used in 06 for one of my campaigns, and we knew how popular it was going to be. It was going to be up here the change was going to happen. The argument that, you know, we, we have to abandon the political process is no better understood by the people that got in it and got screwed. And I'll give you an example. When we started it, we started with 2,500 bucks. You know, a couple of my friends and so on, I, do, I just say eight weeks, we'll make a bunch of signs, send them all our libertarian activists around the country, have them make DVDs, I mean, uh, make a digital tape, you know, of them, hold them out and whatever, send it back to us, we'll put it on YouTube and watch what happens. Well, it did. So the thing is, is we're all of a sudden, now we're saying, wow, man, this is good, we could really travel around, we can kick some ass with this. Yes. Ben Soprinowitz, the libertarian, he's a Las Vegas Review Journal editor, and he was at the, this party, we were talking about this, and he said, Ernie, if you do this, you're going to give all this next generation a delusion that somehow voting is going to make them free. And I go, no, I'm not. They're going to go through exactly what I went through in all through the 90s. As a young activist, playing the game, going through the process, even overwhelming the process in many cases to where they would flood caucuses and primaries and, all, and conventions and all of a sudden they just flip off the lights. All this stuff. I knew they were going to learn. I knew they were going to see it from the inside. They were going to see what went in that sausage and say, hell no. Some of them stayed because that's just the way they are. But a lot of them are right back there. And the reason they're back there is because they know. They don't think they know. They didn't learn it in a book. They didn't have a professor tell it to them. They didn't get it explained by a parent. They know. And I'll tell you, there is no harder activist for the freeing of individual minds outside of this collective matrix mentality. That's why I love when uh, statism is dead, 13, whatever it is. I saw it a year before I even met, knew it was him. I was at Pork Fest 10 or something. I got to go, oh my God, you're the one that did that? Crap, that was awesome. And it frees the mind. 
This is just a step. Now, if the argument is inside of this and you're making fun of it, you're still legitimizing it, that's the only argument that I'm willing to listen to that has, there's no value in it, and I can be persuaded. We're getting to that point. We have other alternatives of communication. And, I, and it's a progression. I've never stayed still on any of this stuff. But I'll tell you, if you abandon, if I wanted, if I had a voluntarist to sit up on that stage in a Republican GOP debate and slap them around and show them what communist, fascist, whatever statist is they are, you know, who would do better than Ron Paul? I'm, I'm, I'm going to roll the dice again and see if I can come up better? Hell no. You know, I'm going, Dr. Paul, you go. And that's one thing. Reporters have asked me, they go, why do you guys always call him Dr. Paul? It's not Congress or something. Because we don't want to insult him. <laughs> Seriously. Isn't that why? <clears throat> Congressman Paul, ew. You know, there, there is so much that he has done that he's not, but I'm not, I'm not going to advocate, you know, he's a politician, he's a, he plays the game, he's a heck, I, I'm shocked he survived as much as he has. But the thing is, is that there has to be a diverseness to this movement. There has to be a, uh, you know, a separation of powers, of, what do you call that, diversity of power, you know what I mean, all that anarchist stuff. But the thing is, is that there is such a diversity in us hitting it from all angles, at all ages, on all issues, that we are in the center of this fight where the eye of Sauron is looking. Does that mean we stay there? No. But there's a progression. And we're missing this progression. Everybody's going, they need to have best practices, whatever, how to live their life. Now, okay, I agree. You know, and how do they get there? Well, they just get there. Well, they don't just get there. Humanity marches. We evolve intellectually as a species, as just by experience. The experience is, is what is going to give us the foundation for us to even understand what the hell it is that we want, much less be able to enact it. When we get people like Free Aid over here and a bunch of other stuff, I heard uh, one uh, pinup girl saying, um, you know, we need to, you know, in the Fed, start a farm. Amen, sister. We had the whole edition of Freedom's Phoenix magazine to that end. <coughs> Education, heck yeah. They even know where the hell you want to go or what the, you know, where the light is. You have Lady Liberty standing there, there's a, there's a torch burning over here, yo. You know, the Freedom's Phoenix fire, that's what that is. Lady Liberty's torch. The rebirth of liberty from the ashes of Lady Liberty's torch. A phoenix. Because freedom is coming again. And if we don't understand what it is that we're fighting for, there won't be anything for us to defend. And how do we get the numbers and the people? And I don't even really care how many people. How many doesn't even matter. It's a type of person. I don't want my foxhole or my, you know, compound or my boat or my space station or my, or heck, just on, you know, my house that isn't somebody that understands what it is to just be left alone. Because there are those that just won't leave you alone. That's it. And it's the people that just want to be left alone. I just want to be left alone and they just won't stop messing with you. And all you have to do is say, you know, what is defined? What is messing with me? How, how do you define? What, what are the, all the things that they do? And in politics, you get to define it. And Dr. Paul has done such a great job. How, how much better off are we by having him up there giving a voice to this stuff? But is politics the way? Does he legitimize the system? And I'm telling you, from the young people who have been involved in this for the past four years or so, they have gotten the greatest lesson ever. No, politics is not the way to get your freedom. It's just a way to show people that's not the way. I don't know how to unravel that last pretzel, so... <laughs> Let me take you on a journey. Because I'm not neutral about politics, I think politics is extremely risky. So imagine you're second in command on a little boat called the Titanic. Think you feel a little bump? Captain comes up and says, listen, uh, I really want to promote you. You've been doing such a great job. I think, uh, I think I want you to be captain now. So here's the hat, here's the little epaulets. You be captain. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna go hang out here by the lifeboats. You, you keep steering, you know, have a good time because uh, everything's gonna go just right, bye. Well, he's promoting you because the ship is done. And everybody knows it's the captain who goes down with the ship. 
And unfortunately, in politics, it's not just the captain who goes down with the ship, it's everything he stands for that goes down with the ship. So, was it Ron Paul just put out, was it five departments he's going to cut? Does anybody know what they are? Education, energy, education. Commerce, My God, we're going to have to live without energy and education. <laughs> We're going back to the caves. What's the matter with this man? Um, I just got an image of him in a cave loincloth. Anybody else? Just me? Okay, just sharing a little bit of how my mind works based on your faces. I'll stop doing that. Um, but if he tries to cut, when he tries to cut, if he gets in power, assuming he can override Congress and get all of that stuff through, let's just carve a magic yellow brick road for him to get his will and his way. Well, what happened to our good friend Scott Walker in Wisconsin? He just tried to tweak a little bit, right? He just tried, you know, listen, maybe we can just negotiate for wages in the present rather than benefits 30 or 40 years from now, which nobody can vote on who's, you know, going to be around there. That's not fair. You got Democratic politicians fleeing the state. You got media apoplexy. You got hate ads. You've got recall elections. I mean, this was just maybe a few less benefits 30 or 40 years from now. What about cutting tens or hundreds of thousands of people out of their work at a time of recession? What are they going to do? Well, they're going to block traffic. They're going to riot. They're going to stand firm. I mean, these are public sector unions. They're the most entitled people on the planet. So what's Dr. Paul going to do in that situation? What would you do? What would I do? Make him eat Greek food. Make what? Make him eat Greek food. Make him eat Greek food. <laughs> I think actually the Greeks are just going to start selling their currency as food. I think that's the next step. But there's going to be aggression. I mean, it, say the government tries to cut farm subsidies. Farms are going to block the highways. They're going to park their tractors in the streets, bring everything to a grinding halt. People are going to start dying in ambulances. And what's the media going to say? Libertarian president killing people in ambulances. <laughs> He's going to have to bring police out to clear the roads to let people through, otherwise the economy comes to a halt. Libertarian president brings water cannons out against poor, striking, defenseless teachers. There's a great risk if the ship is already going down in getting that promotion. <laughs> it is not a good idea. So I would argue that if we accept that he could get in and he could affect his will, all of which are incredibly remote possibilities. That even if he does affect his will, I would argue that it's too late. It's been too late since the 60s. I would argue it's been too late since uh, Johnson's Great Society programs when you created a massive army of dependent classes. The Roman Empire couldn't shake him off. Ottoman Empire couldn't shake him off. British Empire sure as heck couldn't shake him off. Had to ship him overseas. You can't shake off that dependent class without significant amounts of aggression. And the aggression is always reframed as bad for the ideology that's promoting it, or that's pursuing it, or that necessitates it. And so, I think that, I mean, I, Thatcher, right? I remember Margaret Thatcher, right? I mean, she tried to put a little poll tax in so the people who consumed the most services might pay a little bit more for those services. She's right out. And she's still vilified. You still have all of these whiny left-wing musicians complaining about how bad Thatcher was. And that will stain the ideology for approximately 1,000 years, I guarantee it, when people see what it takes to restrain entitled and aggressive and violent state-dependent people. That's what people will remember. They won't remember the ideology. They don't remember the goal. They won't remember it as a noble battle to free people from violence. All they will remember is the endless images of the state acting against peaceful protesters. Because there won't be any other way to do it. These people will go to the wall to maintain their privileges. And unless we're willing to go to the wall against them, I don't think it's a fight we could win. And I think if we are willing to go that far, it is a fight we will lose forever. Because humanity is not ready for sacrifice. They don't even understand what it means to sacrifice for the sake of shrinking the state. Even if, even if, Dr. Paul's campaign were able to grant the equivalent of a PhD in free market economics to every single American citizen, there's still no evidence that anybody would be willing to sacrifice anything. Because people who have PhDs in free market economics still stay. 
in privileged positions and don't come out into the wonderful free world of podcasting and <laughs> touring around and all that kind of stuff. And I have no problem with that, but that's evidence that education is not going to give us freedom. So if education isn't going to do it and political action is going to be worse than useless, we have other alternatives. I'm actually going to give, just give a slight teaser because I'm going to talk a little bit about this in my closing speech at the end of the day today, but there are alternatives that a complete opposite of political action in that you can control them, they're actionable now. They will scientifically and statistically do everything that is necessary to free the world and it has nothing to do with politics and it frankly has nothing to do with education but there is another way and that's what I want to keep promoting because as long as we have the illusion that politics is the path, we'll stop looking for options and there are many other paths that will lead us somewhere else than off a cliff to negative propaganda for the next thousand years. doesn't like Stephanie. <laughs> you know, my, my whole thing is um, everybody's so worried about saving the ship of state. You know, it's always about the Titanic's going down. Who's going to be the captain? Who's going? And, and they go on and on about how they're going to, you know, fix the gaping, ripping, long aside gash in the hull. I don't give a crap about the ship of state. You know, you, you want to be screaming to the people on the ship, get off the ship! You know, you want to be the Carpathia. You know, here, get on, here's a rowboat. I mean, something, who, who's out in the ocean yelling for them, you know, the, the icebergs are coming. You know, who, who's sharing with them another path? I'm, uh, you, you'll hear a lot of times, oh, well, you libertarians just let everybody die and you don't care and you don't have compassion and all this other stuff. This is the most compassion. The sacrifice that you're talking about is what all of us do all the time, trying to share uh, a, a different path, just light the path for people. That's the love, that's the humanity, that's, that's the, the sacrifice that we make for humankind. That. I see it all the time. I see so many selfless acts by so many people that deserve the freedom that they're demanding. And it's coming. In the end, freedom always wins. It just gets really messy first. You have to survive the mess. And if you don't, you know, will freedom wink out? No. Because there's always going to be guys like Stefan. There's always going to be guys like me and you and stuff out there that keep the flame burning. You know, until it's time. One time, <clears throat> Mark Victor, we were doing the summits. We had uh, guys from... Uh, uh, New Zealand come and talk about immigration, you know, how to go. We were thinking about that because in the early 2000s, New Zealand had really the first uh, socialized uh, English-speaking world kind of went whole hog communist and they decided that kind of sucked so they were starting on their way back. And their economies freed up more and a lot of other things. So we were looking to go there. And there was a gentleman that lived out on a ranch out in Lone Prairie. And he was telling Mark, he said, you know, I don't think humanity is ready for freedom yet. He goes, we can keep it alive, we can kind of keep the torch, you know, lit, we can kind of show over here, and this, but I don't think they're ready yet. There'll be a time, that, you know, maybe in a couple of hundred years. And I always thought, I'm going, you know, let me tell you when they're ready. When they're ready. All you got to do is just, you know, we have a Butler Schaefer has been around for decades. We did the interviews, he's talking about libertarian movement since the 50s. You know, th this has been a progression. You can see it coming. And the worse the state gets, the easier it is for us to make our case. Where do we make that case? That is what this debate, in my mind, is about. Where do you make that case? Everywhere. All the time. In the way you live, the way you raise your children, the way you interact with people, wherever the people are, in many various creative ways. I am all about promoting. I come to these things looking for another one to help promote in all of the media, whatever that we do, because you're an inspiration to a 13-year-old kid, a 23-year-old young woman that's out there begging for a book from Larkin Rose. Wow, this is what I thought was happening. And in the young minds, why do you think we support Stefan so much? We've got the QR codes. They're going all over the high school lockers. They're messed up, man. Teachers, deal with that. So, 
I am about, I don't want, because I don't want to do exactly what Stefan said. You do want to give people any kind of confidence that this political system is going to, you know, give us some kind of path to freedom. It's not. It's what took it away. On my website, Freedom's Phoenix, you go to About Us, you know, it's six years old, this paragraph that just says, hey, we knew our rights were being taken from us before the ink was dry on the Constitution. Don't ever think this is a constitutional voting thing. You want to know about us, go read this. We know. What are you going to do about it? Where are you limited? What are you going to not do? Well, I'm not going to do that. Well, you better be doing something else. Because if you always are the, the type of person that says, well, I'm not doing that as if you've elevated yourself because you're not doing something and you're not doing something else, you know, I'm going, well, well at least you're not doing that, I guess. <laughs> do something. Do anything. I'm just creative in one area, making fun of the political process and doing a fairly good job of it. I think we have time for a question or two, or if you want to take a short break, we can. We've got a, um, a panel coming up here. Uh, I'll be up here, some others, uh, and uh, we can do questions there, or we can do them now. What do you guys feel like doing? I have a question. You have a question. <laughs> I, just, I, I just answered it telepathically. Yes, sir. You got a question? Yeah, I don't know, I don't have anything to do with him. No, seriously, a lot of people misunderstand. When we did, you know, it was never the Ron Paul evolution. It was an endorsement of his message. One time they go to me and they say, well, we're going to use your the logo that you created, we're going to use it on the site, and I go, yeah, you and about 1,500 other people. It's the peace symbol, man. It's whatever. I, there, I had somebody send me a Facebook and said, there's this group, Occupy Canada, in Canada somewhere, Occupy, where the heck it was, and they're using your logo, is that with your permission? I claim copyright. No, it's a peace symbol. It's defined by you. Sooner or later, let me tell you what's gonna happen. All these media people are gonna go to this thing, Occupy with the Revolution, they go, well, we thought this was a freedom kind of libertarian, well, obviously you're not it. You know, it defines itself. So I, don't link me or any of the revolutionaries with Dr. Paul's campaign. They embrace that as some kind of legitimacy for him. Fine. You know, I, he's not being too communist, you know, so I'm good with that. But, yeah, you're right. I mean, it's up to you to make sure that the people understand that it's not an endorsement of the political process. It's a message. Yes, sir. Uh, what are either either of you have to say about Ron Paul being religious and saying that evolution is not true? What do either of us have to say about Ron Paul being religious and uh, he's made some claims that he is skeptical about evolution or believes uh, that evolution is not true? Yeah. You're confusing me with someone who cares. <laughs> you know, I I, 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 I really don't care. You know, the... the um, Religion and all the stuff that goes into, you know, I, a lot of people wanted to know about a lot of things that Dr. Paul says. And I'm going, I, am I allowed not to care? I don't care. Well, what resonates with you? What did he say? What did you learn from it? And that's one thing. I've been on lists before where you're, you're making some kind of case on a principle. And from out of the blue, somebody says, do you believe in God? And I'm going, okay, um, I'll play your game. Um, why does that matter? I mean, there's something that, that's going to... Because what they're trying to do is if you do or don't, depending on their position, they're going to delegitimize everything that you said in the email thread or whatever it was you were talking about. The belief or non-belief in the whatever, that diminishes everything that you said regardless of what it was, and that was their argument. Is that, well, you do or don't believe in, so therefore your argument has no weight. If that's your only criteria... You know, then, you know, you're getting inside people's heads and whatever spiritual thing that they've had, as that somehow has tainted everything that they've said. You know, you can make a case for that. A lot of people do. I, I'm looking at how they're interacting with me. How are they using force against me? How are they aggressing against me? What are they advocating? Where are the, where's the gun? That's what I care about. Uh, I, I think it's not good. Uh, I think it's not good. Um, I think that... Uh, if you're going to make a career uh, out of dedicating yourself to the truth, to, to reason, to evidence, 
to philosophy, you kind of have to drive it home. You kind of have to go the whole distance, I think. If you go halfway, you kind of end up in a, a not-so-great place. I mean, I was raised as a, as a Christian. I was an objectivist for many years, and that boat of truth just keeps on going. And I think if you stop it at some place, I think you lose a lot of credibility. I think that it's tough. Look, let's be honest. It's tough in the U.S. to be in the political process without bending some, to some degree to the religious right. Uh, that's just the reality that it's a very powerful lobby. They have a lot to say. Uh, what is it? Uh, the, uh, the pizza guy just got in trouble about his abortion stance and so on. So you have this, they, they're very well organized. They have a lot of media credibility and so on. So I think that there's no doubt that enormous numbers of people have been brought to a more rational position through Dr. Paul's uh, economics and through his politics, through his analysis and so on. But of course, we're all about seeing the unseen, not the seen, right? That's like saying that people have come to anarchism through Dr. Paul. It's like saying people got jobs through government programs. Well, of course they did. But the reality is that it's, it's always what's not there, what's hidden, what's missing. It's all the jobs that weren't created from the government programs. And you don't hear from the people who say, well, you know, Dr. Paul is a guy trained in, in medicine, trained in science, rejecting evolution. That is a, a strike against his intellectual credibility for, I think, for people who are certainly people from the left, right, who tend to be more secular. Uh, that's a problem. And if you give people that excuse to go away, what they'll do is they'll say, well, if he just believes in evolution and he's a libertarian, then I'm going to put those two in the same box and, and look at them as irrational denials of modern scientific reality. Uh, I think that's a problem, but this is the problem with politics. How could he conceivably go into politics and uh, be pro-evolution? He wouldn't get where he is. I think, I mean, not, not that every Christian is against evolution. The funny thing is that the Pope is pro-evolution, but that just hasn't quite made it over here to America yet. But, uh, but I think that's just the reality of politics. I'm not sure how he could do it differently, but I think that does make, uh, it, it is a problem for people who come from more secular and particularly more leftist uh, approaches. Uh, so with the iceberg metaphor, we're going to work that one to death, right? Okay, so the iceberg metaphor is, don't you want everyone to hook up with Kate Winslet? Sorry, was that? <laughs> because I think the answer to that, I think for just about everyone in the audience, is a resounding yes. Uh, yeah, do you want everyone to say you were going to hit the iceberg? Well, yeah, I, I think so. I think we do want to say that the current system is unsustainable. That way we can say that we really do care about the poor and the old, because we're not going to get them dependent on a heroin that's going to get yanked out of their veins. You know, on, on, on this, I think... Dr. Paul has been, I, I really hate to go back to Dr. Paul as often as I do, but he's such a good example. I'm not willing to roll the dice again. I didn't think in my lifetime I was ever going to get someone as, as capable of explaining the philosophy that I've been fighting so hard to instill in people's minds than he has. So I tell you what it did for me. I could put my head down and plow. I didn't have to make excuses for everything. I didn't. Yeah, I knew you know, there's this you know faith thing that's out there and the abortion thing and this you know kind of yeah. But you know what? Uh, he's running for president, not you know governor or whatever. Head down, plow, because it, I knew the fruit that it would bear. But don't ever think that I was bearing fruit so I could turn them over to the C4L for them to use as some kind of money making, block voting, doing politician endorsing crap. Okay, that was never it. It was get these people up to come here, to meet these people, to be these people. That was the, the success that I was striving for. And I think that we, and, and, and how many people does a cattle drove, you know, to step up? So I'm, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic. But the argument, and I'd like to ask Stefan this, we are at a point now to... Where the ideas, just in the last year, keep in mind, in 2004, the internet thing was really just getting going in politics. That's when they first started raising money online, the Dean campaign. That's when they first started getting organized for 08 and so on. So this is a, a very new concept that we didn't have as young activists like you guys. It didn't exist. We had fax trees, okay? So I'm going, you know, are we at the point, have we reached a critical mass now enough that we can openly and actively abandon the political process and leave them to the wolves and feel comfortable that we have made our decision and an open defiance of the entire process and abandon it because we don't want to legitimize it anymore now. You know, are, are we legitimizing it by still participating? You know, that's the question I need to know because it's an answer that I want. Have we exhausted that? Is it over? Do we 
And in 2012 and on, do we go one more time? Because I've always, if, if you're looking for numbers on some computerized vote machine as the representation of the American people, that, that's your gauge of winning or losing. Well, you're looking in the wrong freaking place. It's in the people. And if we can't expand our numbers, if we can't educate more people, if we can't free more minds inside the process, and it can be demonstrated to me that I can be more effective doing it outside fully, I'm all ears. And I know that time will come. Are we there yet? That's all my only question. Seriously, what do you guys, what do you think? Yeah, we're there. And, and of course the internet is a great tool. I mean, how many of us would know each other? I, I are very unlikely to be here without the internet. But it's a tool everyone has. So if everyone gets a Kalashnikov, does it change the battle? Probably not. But, uh, you know, I mean, it just means that we have more tools, but so do they. But, uh, and I'll touch on this more a little bit this afternoon. We're, we're dealing with the problem of evil. We're dealing with the problem of evil. That's fundamentally what we're about. We are cape crusaders against evil, whether we like it or not, whether we look good in tights or not. We are See, cape crusaders against evil. acceptance of evil. Evil's always going to be there. It's just, if we're dealing with our acceptance of it. Right, right. So, uh, the, what I think is underappreciated in libertarianism is the degree to which uh, medical science, brain scans, and, and medicine has... We know what the virus for evil is. We know what creates evil within human beings now. Child abuse creates evil within human beings. That's, this is clear. The science is very clear. And that's why I focus on parenting. Uh, you know, 90% of parents are still hitting their children. This is medieval. They're still hitting their children. And we say that the problem with violence is something to do with the Federal Reserve. That's just an effect of what goes on for most kids. And it's not, I mean, even if you're the best parent in the world, you have really bad schools out there. They're destructive to children's minds, where aggressions and threats and humiliation from peers is still very common. You have uh, bad preachers out there filling kids' eye of hellfire and damnation, and if you disobey and so on. We need to deal with the, prop with the initiation of force within the family, and then it will roll out very, very quickly that the initiation of force within society is going to diminish, because children who are raised peacefully do not speak the language of violence, and when someone in authority comes and goes, rah, 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 they won't even understand, be like someone yelling at you in Mandarin. It may be amusing, but it's not going to be terrifying. You just can't teach children that language, and that's how we free the states. It has nothing to do with politics. That's just an effect of what goes on for most people within the family. to say I'm, I'm, I'm really glad that he's taken the get to inside I'm really glad that he's taken this approach because having had four children two grandkids and everything I I tell you you know you fix I call it generation next you know you fix generation next just not to be psychotic you know whole bunch of problems go away and it seems like they're doing it on purpose doesn't it Nick How do I suggest that people try and stop child abuse? Well, uh, there are lots of things you can do. Uh, you, of course, can educate parents. I uh, put out lots of videos, uh, interviews with psychologists and scientists and brain experts. You can certainly send them to my uh, material. Uh, I have a whole series that's on my uh, website of interviews with psychologists and, and experts in this area. So educate them. Oops. <laughs> but not about politics. <laughs> but no, educate, educate parents. Understand that, that spanking decreases IQ. Spanking increases aggression. Spanking uh, uh, increases resistance uh, to, to legitimate and positive authority within parents. So spanking increases sibling aggression. Spanking creates all of the things that you're trying to diminish through spanking. Of course, it's violence. It always achieves the opposite of what you intend. So uh, educate parents. Uh, if you see uh, children being abused uh, in, in your extended family or if they're being hit or even yelled at or threatened, you don't need to yell the children never raise my voice at my daughter and she's fantastic to be with and she's very obedient because there's mutual respect I just have to obey her too uh, but uh, so yeah within your family within your extended family within your community within your church bring this information to light the, the studies are relatively new but they're very uh, almost completely unanimous about the destructive effects of that uh, so within your family within your community within your church within uh, society as a whole you can intervene you can do so many things and of course, if you become a parent, you simply say, hey, I'm into the non-aggression principle. Where can I apply that first and foremost? Well, in my personal relationships with my children. Sorry. Uh, something so fundamentally important, would it be uh, important to use the biggest stage possible? I'm sorry, is this not big enough? This is the biggest one I've been on. <laughs> I mean, Aretha Franklin can do cartwheels here. I think she did in the last show, much to everyone's surprise. Are you talking surprise. about the political theater or something, or what? I don't think Ron Paul talking about child abuse in the GOP debate is going to... Uh, 
Sorry? Get some laws passed. Yeah, I'll get some laws passed, banning spanking. Yeah, it'd, be, it'd be like Stefan running for office uh, on this one particular issue, but in that position, what happens? Yeah, you diminish his effectiveness. No. No, look, you know, you, you kind of you mix him in with the politics. I mean, you know, some people are not in a position to do that, but some are. I don't you have know? politicians' hairdo. You got to have that Ken thing. <laughs> no, look, I mean, uh, I, I don't believe in obviously laws aren't going to solve it because all laws do. It'd be like the drug trade, just drive it underground and, and make it harden the position. It, it's education to parents. That, I mean, I believe that the vast majority of parents have kids with the idea of loving them and doing the very best for them, and then they just, you know, through history, through a lack of knowledge, they just go astray. They go down that path of using aggression against kids, and then they find that they have to use more and more. I mean, you know that old thing where one government program leads to another government program to fix the problems of the first government program, which leads to a third, to a tenth? It's the same thing with aggression against kids. You start yelling at them, then you've got to start hitting them because they stop listening to yelling, then you've got to hit them harder. It escalates because it, it creates creates more of the problems that you're trying to solve with it. So uh, I think it's just a matter of, of educating people. Personally, we can do so much in our personal relationships. We don't have to focus on a global stage where we're almost completely inaudible to the general population. It is a personal relationship expansion of, uh, I think, peaceful parenting that, that is going to be the most effective. Before we end this, I wanted to just kind of ask a question real quick. Um, we're at an anarchist, voluntarist, libertopia event. And I, and I just want to get a sense of the people here. How many are ready for the total abandonment of electoral politics as a, as a vehicle? Woo! Reach for the skies, my brothers and sisters. Yeah. Okay, is there anybody that's willing to raise their hand uh, you know, that's for using the political process after that? Yes, okay. So, I don't know, let's be fair. We got some. Yeah, so, so, I mean, you know, it, it's, it, it's there. And when the opportunity strikes, I may or may not take advantage of it or whatever. I, I, my running for office days are done. But, you know, the thing is, is that it's not that I'm for abandoning a, a target-rich environment. I'm not going to make that blanket statement. But it's getting much closer than it has ever been in the 20 years of my family's activism and our friends and everything in Phoenix. 20 years of every single election cycle. And it's gotten to the point when they did the Occupy Phoenix thing, I wrote, uh, uh, he's the editorial page editor of one of the papers there, that's now chief of staff of one of the city councilmen, and they had me write a guest article in 2000 when I was running for office, asking me, Ernie, we need you to write an article to get people to vote, nobody's voting anymore, you should encourage people to vote. And the title of the article, uh, Voting Never Brought Freedom to Anyone, this is year 2000, and the last paragraph it said, at the end times, you will be begging for libertarians to participate in the presidential debates because that's the only way you'll get people to watch them. But by then, people will be in the streets demanding to be left alone, regardless of the vote totals accurate or not. I saw this coming. So I sent that to them. All of a sudden, they go to the occupiers, 24-7 access. Sorry for having arrested all your friends. You may come back. Okay? Because I think the bad guys see it too. They don't understand the full ramifications of this, but there is a shift, there's a time, there is a way of organizing just your own mind in the fight for freedom. And I adapt. Thanks. Thank you, and thank you so much, Ernie. That's really, really enjoyable. Let's, let's take two minutes. I'm sorry we went way.